How you doing guys, welcome to another video. This is topic 11.3, volume three, what is MMR? And this was a topic that I really enjoyed at Organic Chemistry in university. You've got a very simplified version, the higher levels have a little bit more, enjoy. So volume three, what is NMR? Nuclear Magnetic Resonance Spectroscopy. We look at how does NMR interact with molecules and we look at chemical environments and chemical shifts. Basically, we need to use the NMR to determine uh, the structure of compound Texref 559 to 564, check it out. So NMR is a technique for determining the structure and arrangement of molecules, in particular, nuclei with an odd number of protons. Now, in IB, we'll only specifically look at hydrogen NMR, but there are other types of NMR. These atoms behave like tiny bar magnets, and if you apply an external magnetic field, they'll either line up with or against the, elect the, uh, the external magnetic field. Now, if you're aligned up with the external magnetic field, you're said to be in a low energy spin state. If you line up against the magnetic field, you are said to have be in a high energy spin state. Now what NMR does is it shoots radio waves at these nuclei and that's enough to be able to flip their spin states. And what it does is determine the energy required to flip those spin states and then it produces that as an electric signal, which we see as a spectrum. So NMR is a very low energy technique that interacts with the nuclei of atoms. There is enough energy in the radio waves to change the spin state of the nuclei, and then that is the energy that is determined. We look at the energy required to flip that spin state, and that depends on the environment of the atom. If we have an NMR machine, it's very difficult to compare one to the other. So we use this chemical called TMS, tetramethylsilane, as a standard. Now TMS needs to be added to each sample that you want to put through the NMR, and it has a series of hydrogens that are usually well away from anything else that we're interested in. Now it produces a single small peak at what we call zero parts per million, or zero chemical shift. Basically, it allows us to get a zero point on our NMR, and then we work to the left of that peak. So it needs to be added as a, as a reference to anything we want to analyze in the NMR. The NMR produces a series of peaks which correspond to the protons that are present. All of those peaks are compared to TMS and what is called the chemical shift, which is measured in parts per million, gives us an indication of the type of proton that we might be dealing with. Basically, the more to the left of TMS, the, more, the closer you are to an electronegative element, or the less charge density you have as a proton. We don't need to know the specific use of the machine, but we do need to be able to interpret the spectrum. The heights of the peak, or the areas of the peak, tell us how many protons are present in that environment. So if a peak is three times as big, there's three times as many protons. The proton NMR is used to determine the number of distinct chemical environments there are in a molecule. And the number of peaks in an NMR tells us the number of different hydrogen environments in the molecule. So here we have propanone, and I've got the formula there for you. Now if we run, run propanone through the NMR, we see one peak. So that means we have one chemical environment, one environment for the protons. Now if we have a look at the structure, we've got two CH3 groups which are either side of this C double bond O. But because they're both bonded to the same thing, then they're actually in the same chemical environment. They're not different. And the NMR sees them as one peak because they look the same. Their chemical environment is they're a CH3 group and they're attached to a C double bond O. Often this will occur if we have symmetry in the molecule. So there's a line of symmetry in propanone, which means we have half as many peaks as we expect. Dimethoxymethane, on the other hand, has two peaks, which means that it has two distinct chemical environments. 
we have some CH3s at either end of the molecule, and then in the middle we have a CH2. Now, the CH3 is connected to an oxygen. The CH3 at the other end, well, that's also connected to an oxygen. So those two things are chemically equivalent. They're in the same environment. The CH2, well, for starters, it's a CH2, and it's connected to two oxygens. So it's in a very different environment to the CH3s. So we see that, or the NMR sees that, as a very different peak. You can see by just looking at the sizes of the peaks that the size indicates the number of protons. One of the key things that we need to be able to do is to determine the number of chemical environments in a molecule. So every time there is a different environment, we will produce an individual peak. So here's a number of different types of molecules, and we need to be able to determine how many peaks we would see in the NMR. The easiest way is to draw these out, which is why we practice some organic chemistry, and then to, de to determine how many chemical environments. So for ethane, we have two CH3 groups, and they're both connected to each other, so the NMR would see that as one, one chemical environment. Propanoic acid, on the other hand, has a few different protons. It's got a CH3 group, a CH2 group, and then the acid functional group. Now the NMR will look at chemically distinct protons, so each proton environment. So the easiest one to recognize straight away is the hydrogen attached to the acid. Well that's in an environment all by itself because there's nothing similar. We have a CH2 group which is connected to the acid functional group and then we have a CH3 group at the end. So here we have three distinct chemical environments. What I'd like you to do is have a go at the next three and see if you can uh, see if you can do them. So butane will have two peaks, two chlorobutane. Well, that's an interesting one. Here we have our hydrogen with our chlorine. That's in the environment all by itself. We have a CH two group in the middle. But the question is, are those two CH three groups on the end the same or different? Well, one of the CH3 groups is connected to the carbon with the chlorine, and the other one is connected to a CH2. So that will have four chemical environments. Butanoin, well, butanoin has the CH2 at the end with the double bond. We have a CH, which is different. And then we have a CH2 that doesn't have a connection to a double bond, and then the CH3 at the end. So that will have four chemical environments as well. The number of chemical environments, is the number of peaks in the structure, in the spectrum. So here we have a low resolution NMR with the chemical formula of C2H6O. We need to be able to use the NMR to determine a possible structure. So we use what we call the integrations, which tells us the areas to work out how many protons are in each environment. Now to work out what these protons might be, we can use page 27 of the data book to have a look at the functional groups. So if you've got your data book there, you'll see that at between 0 and 0 0.9 and 1 part per million, we generally find our CH3s. Now because this has three hydrogens, that's typical of a CH3 group. We've got an oxygen in this compound, and here we have an integration for one oxygen. Now an alcohol group can be a little bit funny. It can be somewhere between one and five, but the main thing is it only integrates for one hydrogen. So that's most likely to be an alcohol group. The, C, the two H's at around 3.5, that's typical of a CH2 group, and that could be a CH2 group that's attached to that oxygen. Now, I call these things terminators or connectors. A terminator is one that ends a molecule, and a connector is something that continues the molecule. So our CH3 group, that would be a terminator because it ends the molecule. Our OH group, well, that's a terminator as well. And our CH2 is a connector. So I put that in the middle, which gives us ethanol. Here we have another organic compound with the formula C3H6O2. 
We are told that it reacts with bases and is soluble in water, and we need to go through and work out what the peaks A, B, and C are. If it reacts with an acid with a base, that means it's most likely to be an acid. So when I think of an acid, I think of the carboxy functional group, the C double O H. When we have a look at the spectrum, we can see that we have three peaks, which means three chemical environments. Those peaks, there's one right up there at 12, and then we've got two that are close together. We've been given the integrations as three, two, and one. Let's have a look at the peak at about 12 parts per million. Now this is typical of an OH of an acid, and that's shown in the data book. So I must have an acid functional group, and I would describe that as being a terminator. That must be at the end of a molecule. Then we have the two other groups. We have a CH, what could be a CH3 at about one part per million. So that's pretty typical of just a CH3 group. Again, that would be another terminator because it's going to stop the molecule from continuing. Then we need to have a look at our two hydrogens at peak B at around 2.5, something like that. We have, this is in the range of a CH2. And that CH2 we could describe as being a connector. So we would have our connector in the middle and our two terminators at each end, which means that we are most likely looking at propanoic acid for this NMR. CH3, CH2, C double O H. Okay, so volume three, some top tips. Use the chemical environments. You can nearly get all of the information from the chemical environments. If you need to go a bit further, use the data book to try and work out what functional groups you've got present, and you'll be given more information than just the NMR. Thanks for watching, guys. Don't forget, drop a like on the video, subscribe if you're new, and I'll see you.